Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, okay. Uh, so, any questions about the project before I? What um, in the in the report uh, you wanted to see like graphs or plots uh, of what? <laughs> of uh, let's see. Um, Plots or graphs or tables, just some discussion of, okay, here's here's how fast the CSQR is for some problems, here's some problems, and then here's here's my code, and then here's the QR in MATLAB. A table will be fine. Is there something like non-zeros versus time? Uh, you could, well, okay, in terms of in terms of plotting uh, the performance. Uh, if you really wanted to plot the performance, what you would do, let's see if I have it. Um, if you wanted to do a full-blown analysis, which you don't have to do, but this is what I would, if I was working on this and trying to decide who, which code is faster and why, um, I think I have a slide here. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Remember, uh, why is this silly thing? Computers sometimes just get in the way of what you're trying to do, I tell you. Windows is so annoying. Do you want to update? We are going to reboot your computer in 15 seconds. No. <laughs> Please. Uh, okay. So what do we have here? Every dot is a, is a matrix. And the x-axis is the flop count divided by the memory usage in bytes. Okay, and so now that's a little hard to get from the QR in MATLAB unless you call and unless you install it from my source code, because then I provide extra hooks for data collection and statistics. It's the same code, but the MathWorks doesn't expose all of my all my guts, you know. And this is guts. No guts, no glory. Um, but you can actually compute some of these. For example, the flop count, you know, uh, well, let's see. Like, I mean, th this would be difficult for you to generate. You'd have to do some coding and, and such to get this kind of data. Memory usage, you could certainly compute that. You could compute your own flop count. You could just keep track. Um, however, the flop count that I used here was not the count that actually happened in my algorithm, but what would occur, well, let's see, no, I'm trying to remember. No, I take that back. I did do an actual flop count. Anyway, um, you could do, uh, certainly the flop count for sparse Cholesky is well defined. You could do, you could do the symbolic analysis of A transpose A and do the sum of the squares of the column counts, that gives you a Cholesky flop count, and that's kind of a placeholder here. Um, and the memory usage in bytes, you could just put the non number of non-zeros in the factors, for example, as a denominator. And then you look at the performance here in terms of uh, gigaflops, per billions of floating point operations per second. And what will happen is, you know, you know, LAPAC will be here, my code will be here, your code will be here, you know, the QR will be here too. But I mean, th this is a full-blown analysis. You don't have to do anything like this. But this is this is one direction you, that could go. But just give me some indication of look. I tested it on some small matrices, some big. Try some big matrices, and then um, uh, make sure you get the right answer, of course. Uh, to uh, to determine if you do get the right answer, you know, you might not get the same R, even though it's a good R. Because R might not be the same as R. That's a rather odd formula. Um, the reason is, is because R is not unique in the sense that you could take R and multiply the diagonal by minus 1. In other words, it basically takes the vector and flips it the other direction. So when you're doing this, this rotation, these Gibbons rotations or this householder, you're taking these vectors and you're splatting them along a x, y, or z, or you know x1 through x1000, whatever, axis. But you could splat them along the x-axis, or it could go along the negative axis. 
So the sign flips, but it's equally valid. So uh, the sign can differ because, and if you look at what R, you know, if you look here, R transpose R, you know, is that equal to A transpose A? Well, if you stick a, a diagonal of minus ones in the middle, they just cancel each other out. If I take R and multiply it by minus identity, and then I do that transpose, the minus identities cancel. They just cancel. So the minus signs just disappear. So if you look at the R, you might think, oh, gee, I got the wrong R. But it might be a good R, actually. In fact, this probably will happen. So you just need to either check this. Of course, this takes a lot of work to, to multiply. I mean, for small matrices, this is fine. R transpose R should equal A transpose A to within some, you know, take the norm of this, divide it by the norm of, say, A transpose A. That's expensive to compute for big matrices, but at least for small matrices, you can tell whether or not you got the right answer. And if you think you got the wrong answer, you look at the two R's, check the sign. You know, t say take the absolute value of both R's, and they, they probably will match up. Um, the uh, other thing to see if you get the right answer is you could use, let's see, how would we do this? Um, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to minimize AX minus B. Um, you're not keeping Q. I have to look, there's a, if you look, if you look at, uh, and I don't have MATLAB pulled up here, but if you do, if you do help QR in MATLAB, I don't remember the formula, but if you do help QR, it'll give you an example at the very bottom of some lines of code to to compute um, to to find the 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 minimum the the least squares solution to AX equals B. AX doesn't quite equal B, of course, because it's a least squares problem uh, without without having Q and it's called the semi, the corrected semi-normal equations. And it just takes the R that you have. So it's not quite normal. <laughs> so it's semi-normal. Uh, and you, 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 it's a few lines of MATLAB code. You just plunk in the R, and you plunk in A, and you plunk in B, and you get out X. You don't really have to worry about what this actually does. But that's the code. So you have A, you have B, you, you have your R. You have the MATLAB R, you could just verify that this gives you uh, a, a, a minimum least square solution. And then you could put in your R. And to determine if you have, I mean, the question is, when, did I, when do I minimize the norm of AX minus B? Uh, that is when A transpose AX e should equal A transpose B. Uh, and this is another test, by the way. Um, you could, in fact, this is related to this one here, I th think. It's the, because this will be, let's see, let me see if I can derive this. R transpose X should be equal to A transpose B. And so if you take X and you just do this, I think this is the first step of the, of the uh, corrected sum, because there's one step of, of iterative refinement after this. So if that gives you an X, that'll give you an X. Okay? And then you can plug that X back into this formula right there. Right? Take A transpose and to if you want to really do it on big problems, do this. Compute this vector E, this is the residual. This should be zero. And if it's zero or close to zero or small, small relative to the norm of A. I mean, you can get 10 to minus 3 here real easy if A is 10 to the 20 in magnitude. Uh, but compute that, and that thing should be relatively small. So that'll help you know if you got the right answer. But um, but just, a just, just even a list of, okay, I ran it on these matrices, and here's the results I got, and here's what MATLAB QR did, and here's what... Um, the C sparse QR did in the book. So that that would be how to do that. 
that answer your question? I think so. And uh, I'm going to look at the calendar today. And as I mentioned, I'll probably extend the due date. Any Whoops, I just deleted the wrong thing for the project anyway and just make it six projects. Whoops, no, that's the wrong thing. Okay. But you should all have at least started the project. Because um, uh, even if I extend the due date, don't assume that you can do it in a day. I mean, you can't. This is not a day. You have to do it and then get stuck and then come and talk to me, right? Unless you're really good. And I've had three people ask me questions about the project. I'm kind of I'm kind of surprised. Uh, and, and and two of you are no. Let's see. Have you asked me a question about it? Not really. Well, anyway, two of the three of you are sitting are sitting in this classroom uh, right now. So I know some of you are on it. The rest of you in TV land I have no idea. All right. So fill reducing orderings. Uh, we're looking at an NP hard problem. And uh, I'm not going to prove to you that it's NP hard. The reduction to this from a known NP hard problem is fairly complex. And it doesn't really, unfortunately, I think, uh, doesn't really reveal uh, much about the difficulty of this problem. I mean, it just, it's just, it's a rather dry proof. So, I mean, people cite this, pa there's a paper by Yanakakis or Yanakis who proved this. But people cite it just to say, oh, it's NP hard, and then they, they go on. You know, they don't go and say, well, this tells us something about the problem. We can use this kind of heuristic. Unfortunately, that proof doesn't really lead to any interesting algorithms which is a pity, until someone proves that p equals np, which would have the corollary, of course, that n equals 1. Right? <laughs> you, 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 you've, I'm sure you, you know, if p equals np, if and only if n equals 1. You, you've heard, of course, also that the, the, Latin, the Romans were really great in algebra. Because x is always 10. <laughs> so they had all this down. You know, we're trying to solve ax equals b. Well, they just knew the answer. All right. I shouldn't be so harsh on the Romans. They did conquer my ancestors. They didn't quite get yours. The Germans, right? They pushed. They tried. They didn't quite. Of course, I'm half German, so what am, I, what am I saying that? My Davis side, they conquered that. They didn't conquer my mother's side. All right. Um, yeah, on my fa I come from Wales on my father's side. Uh, dolphins and mermaids on my mother's side. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, enough jokes this morning. I'm in a I'm in a odd mood. I'll tell you why next class. All right, minimum degree method. So we have an NP hard problem. We're going to find a permutation, and in, minimum degree methods are a local greedy heuristic. Okay, we don't know what order to order this graph in. There is some order that gives us the minimum fill, and uh, we don't know what that is. But we can say, well, let's, obviously the next, well, not obviously, but if I pick a node of very high degree, that could cause a lot of fill-in. 
So let me pick a note of very low degree, and hopefully that'll cause low fill-in, and then that will that high amount of fill-in will propagate later on because this fill-in can cause more fill-in, can cause more fill-in. So that's not good. It's a local greedy strategy. There are global strategies called nested dissection methods. These are based on graph partitioning, and I'll talk about those uh, as well. So minimum degree is where we're at right now. And this is something I've done a lot of work in myself, and I developed what was called the approximate minimum degree, and that's used exclusively now. Uh, so it's... Uh, but. The minimum degree algorithm now, I need, to, I need to go in. I gave you that sort of broad brush overview. Now I need to go into some details to explain how it is we can implement this efficiently. Because at the very first analysis, it's a very simple algorithm. Okay? And here's the algorithm. I mean, I can say it almost in one breath. You know, it's, it's really not that complicated. You take a graph and you pick a node. You annihilate that node. And you add edges to the neighbors until they form cl a clique. Repeat until you're done. And what order do you pick the nodes in? Well, of the nodes you have so far that are not yet eliminated, pick the one of least de degree. Of course, there could be multiple ones of least degree, and people have played a lot with tie-breaking methods. The problem is, is you're having to do tie-breaking methods don't really get you very far because it's a heuristic on top of a heuristic, and it just doesn't help. The best node to pick might not be the one of least degree anyway. So what, what this graph elimination process is modeling is it's modeling Gaussian elimination with symmetric perm permutations. So you, you, you have a, 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 a pivot here and you have some a pivot row and a pivot column. And then when you annihilate this pivot, when you eliminate this pivot, you cause your your active your resulting submatrix that has yet to be factorized to be added to it 16 non-zeros if you have it four neighbors. Of course, the diagonal we assume is present because we're assuming a Cholesky factorization. But we know, of course, how Cholesky and QR and LU are all related. Right? We've already done that. So. If we look just at Cholesky, this gives us information about QR and LU, but we're not going to deal with these yet uh, in, in this. We're, let's assume an, an outer product, a right-looking Cholesky, which is a right-looking Cholesky is hard to implement, but in this graph structure, it, it gives us a picture for what happens. What's the consequence of picking this pivot? Because I could I could just permute. I could say, well, no, 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 no. I want to pick this instead and swap. And I want to swap along the diagonal because I don't want to destroy symmetry because I'm doing Cholesky factorization. Swapping along the diagonal is just a matter of renumbering the nodes. So that's why I say just pick a node, any node, eliminate it, repeat. So, um, and here's the, here's the right-looking Cholesky that gives us that. And here's, this is the addition of the clique right here. The k Row, I'm um, sorry, this is the kth column and the kth column transpose added back to this A matrix. And so we want to keep track of the graph of A. That's all we're doing. Keep track of the graph of A, and then we'll, at the kth step, don't necessarily pick the kth row and column. Do, some, do a swap and pick something else. It's very simple. But to implement this, think about what this would have to happen, how this would have to happen. If you were trying to just, if you just wrote this MATLAB code, which Actually, oh, I did. Um, but guess what? This is slow. Why is it slow? For several reasons. Um, it's very difficult to take a, a data structure and make it dynamic enough that you can just slap in a clique to it. I mean, think of the graph you have, right? Compressed sparse column matrix. It's an adjacency list of a graph. And then say to that graph, here's a clique. Here, take it and add those edges to it. you got to un you got to unravel all the adjacency lists and say, oh, I'm going to insert you here. And I mean, it's just, it's a very dynamic operation. The data structure we have right now in the, in the book doesn't really support that very well at all. Um, which is why some things in MATLAB are very slow, because you can write this code in MATLAB. But guess what? It actually, it actually has to do that. I mean, I'm, it's impressive. What, uh, well, actually, this is, this is, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what has to happen under the hood for all this to work. Think about it. Think about what the guys at the math works, or the gals, actually. There's Penny Anderson has done a lot of work on this, too. So I should say the guys and gals. Sorry, Penny, if you're watching this eventually. Um, you know, the, there's a sparse matrix addition here. There's a sparse matrix, matrix multiply. There's a ex extracting a submatrix, adding in another matrix to it, and then inserting, this is even more fun, the sparse subassignment. How would Think about how would you would do that. And, and all of that, the data structures, the common framework for this entire computation is the compressed sparse column matrix form with sorted row indices with no explicit zeros and so forth, all those constraints. And you have to do it for the complex case as well as the real case. Not trivial. So this is this would be slow to write. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop a graph algorithm that could do this symbolically. No values, right? We don't care about the values, just the pattern. And we're going to do it extremely fast so that in the end, the astonishing result is that in practice, not in theory, of course, you've heard the only difference between theory and practice is that in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is, right? Yeah. Say that 10 times fast. So in, in practice, this will take time proportional close to time proportional to the number of non-zeros in the A matrix. Think about that. This is a Cholesky factorization, Cholesky flop counts, which is more than the number of non-zeros in L, which is more than a non-zeros in A. Okay, It's absurd that the amount of work that this would do versus the very end, this crystalline essence of the minimum degree algorithm that has all these features added to it to make it extremely fast in practice. Okay, so some notation. What we're going to do is we're not going to represent the elimination graph itself. Okay, This is this idea of why, if I want to add a clique to a graph, okay, there's two ways of doing it. I can go to each node and say, oh, you have these 10 new edges. And I can go to this node and say, you have these 10 new edges. And I can do that for 10 nodes. The same 10 edges. Well, I could do that. Or I could say, look, node 5, you have an edge to a new kind of node, which I'll call an element. It represents the clique. And this element says that, oh, there are 10, 10 nodes connected to this element. So if you ever want to know the adjacency of a node, you have to ask, well, who are you adjacent to? No, what nodes are you adjacent to? And then what elements are you adjacent to? And then take their nodes. Take the set union, and that's your adjacency. In other words, what's going to happen is if I have this graph, okay, and let me add one more node here. Let's suppose I annihilate node 1. Okay, if I annihilate node 1, I have two options. One option is I could just make a clique of its four neighbors. So I could just explicitly add um, all of these edges like that. Okay. I've just now some of those edges were already there. I just obliterated them. One, two, three, four, five. I added six edges, which is four squared minus four, right? No, over two, because yeah, four squared minus four over two is six. So I just added six edges. And then I can remove node one. All right, but those are new edges that I don't have memory for, and I don't want to take the. I do not want to take the time to add them either, because if I take the time to add them, then I'm doing Cholesky flop count work. So I don't want to do that. I want to do this much more simply and elegantly. Let me erase this now, and show you what we do. And this is this is um, leading up to this idea of the quotient graph. The idea is that okay, look, I'm going to I'm I'm going to annihilate node 1, but just like the Cheshire Cat, C.S. Lewis, if not read that, um, the, um, not C.S. Lewis, Lewis Carroll. Oh, my goodness. Where's my brain? Yes, curious. Okay, so I'm going to take node 1 and say, node 1, you are going to now represent a new kind of node. You are going to no longer be a node in the graph. You're going to represent the existence of a clique in the graph of the nodes that remain. 
So this note is gone, but its smile remains, if you will. Okay, the smile says that these four nodes form a clique. Now what I can do is if I'm at this node here, I can say, well, who are you connected to? Well, I'm connected to this node. This node's connected to this one directly, but it's also connected to this node via this clique. See, it looks here and says, ooh, you're a special node. You're a element, element E1. And this node here says that you look at this and say, well, well who's in this element? All four nodes. So this node is then connected pair pairwise to each of these other three nodes, including itself, which of course is not needed, but it doesn't hurt to, to have it there. We can just ignore ourself, ourselves if we see ourselves. The other thing, the other then observation that we can make is that, well, this edge here is no longer necessary. Okay, these two nodes are connected to each other, but now they're connected via this element which represents a clique, including these two nodes. So why have this edge? We can remove it and prune our data structure. Okay, if we keep the data structure pruned, it'll eventually end up that the whole data structure, the, the edges, the number of edges in the graph does nev never increases beyond the number of edges in the A matrix. Okay, and I'll, let me explain why that's true. I don't know if I have a proof in the book. So this edge goes away as well. Uh, the, the reason this proof, okay, the, the, the reason this proof works is that the, the, that the idea that the number of, the number of edges always decreases is the following. Every, every node here, um, had had an, an edge to the existing node one, or for instance, if I annihilate, suppose I, the next thing I do is annihilate this node. If I annihilate this node, okay, you know what? I can't do this proof yet until I've done more with the algorithm. Let me not do the proof. But the, the idea is, is with this new data structure now, the data structure take space that's equal to or less than the original matrix. So now we're in, we have an in-place algorithm. We're modifying this graph in place, and the graph does not grow in size. That's very handy. That means we, when we, at the outset, when we start the algorithm, if we allocate enough memory to start the problem, we know we can finish it. And that's a very useful thing to, to know. So you can do, do this algorithm on really, really huge graphs. Okay, so what happens next? Suppose um, suppose node two here gets annihilated next. Okay, now what would happen? Well, node two, we have to look at node two and say, well, I need to make a clique of my neighbors. So who are my neighbors? That's a very biblical question, isn't it, right? Uh, who are my neighbors? Nodes one and three? No. Uh, more nodes than that are my neighbors. There's this little Samaritan up here who's also my neighbor. Uh, the, the idea here is that node two is also connected to this node. Node two, and let me give a number here, four, five, and six. Node two is connected to node three because it has, has an original edge there. It's connected to node four, five, and six as well through element one. So what would happen? I could take node two and replace it with an element. Okay. And now I need to add these edges because now I need to represent the fact that two is connected, two is a, is a clique of these four nodes. But now think about what just happened here. The, ele the list of node one is a subset of the list of the, of the connectivity of, of ele uh, element two. I'm sorry, the, the, the element one is a subset of element two. Because when I asked element node two, who are you connected to? I looked at element one and included that in the list. So L1 is a subset of L2. And I'm using L to denote the, uh, uh, the 
non-zero pattern of E1. And the reason I'm doing that, I guess I call I should call I think I call it L sub E1. Or just L1. Yeah. Because this is the this is the non-zero pattern of the first, I have it here, the first uh, column of the Cholesky factor L, and this is the second one. And they're subsets of each other because of this edge here. Well, if they're subsets of each other, this element here says that, oh, those four nodes are a clique. They're, in a, they're a member of a clique. And this new element, too, says that, well, these five are in a clique. And the four are a subset of the five. One guy says four are in a clique. And the other guy says, one guy says four are in a clique. And the other guy says five are in the clique. Well, I don't need the four anymore. I don't need element one to tell me that these five... If I drop element one away, I still have the fact that, that these five here are in a clique, right? They're all pairwise connected. So what that means is I can prune my graph. I can say, look, I don't need element one anymore. You're gone. Okay. As a result of this, what's called element absorption, no two elements in the graph are adjacent to each other. They can't be. I just if they're adjacent, they get consumed, like black holes. Okay, no two black holes can orbit one another. They get one consumes the other. Uh, that's bad physics, actually. That's probably not the case. Somewhere in the universe, I'm sure there's two black holes spinning around each other. I doubt. You know. Anyway, what else? What other simplifications can we make in this graph? Well, this edge would be go, would be gone too. Because this new element two says that three, four, five, and six all form a clique, and you know I don't need that edge anymore. So the graph it gets simpler as we go on. It doesn't get more complicated; it gets simpler. And so the total amount of edges in the graph decreases or stays the same because of element absorption uh, and because yeah, because of element absorption. So, so if if you have a new node i as an edge to j, let me call this k. So here's k, the new element. If in the final analysis there's going to be an edge here, then how did that edge get there? There's one of two ways that that edge can get there. Either j could have been directly connected to node k. In this case, the degree of j in the quotient graph, okay, the degree of node 4 in the quotient graph here is 2. This is the size of the data structure needed to represent node 4. It's 2. The degree of the node in the elimination graph that tells us well, which one of thing of least degree do we wish to annihilate is, is more than that. It's the set union of this node plus these other guys. It's what? 4. Okay, But 4 is not the size of the data structure. The size of the adjacency list for 4 is 2. 4 has two things in it. It has a reference to element 2, and it has a reference to node 3. That's the adjacency list in this quotient graph of node 4. If I want to know what the adjacency list is for node 4 in the elimination graph, I have to take 3 and the set union with the list 2. I have to take L2 union with this initial list, which it now has just node 3 in it. I have to take that set union to find out but the data structure is very compact. So I have to store one more thing, though. So anyway, so either, let me go back here. So either node J was adjacent to node K, in which case now we have this, or they were adjacent through some other element. Okay, now what happens in this case is that, well, look, node, this element right here, because it was it's, it's adjacent to node K, the new element K will include, so I have some edges here, node, node element k, ek, will have edges to all these nodes. So what do I need x for anymore? x goes away. There's no two elements adjacent to each other in the quotient graph. So this goes away, and that means this goes away too, and it's replaced by this. But what happens to node j? The adjacency of J change in the quotient graph change from this to this. 
It did not increase. The data structure for J, the list of J, did, it changed. It had X in it. So if I look at J and I look at the list, I see EX, element X. And when I'm done, I'm going to see some stuff and I'll say EK instead. The length of this list did not grow. Okay, that's cool. The length of the list didn't grow. Um, so, but what about K itself? So the other nodes don't grow in size. That's good. Um, the K, though, could get quite large. And we have to store this pattern as well. But the idea here is that, let's see, and I haven't thought through this proof for a while. I apologize. I should have looked at this before, and I don't know if I have it in the book. But the idea here is that every, every edge here uh, comes from one of two things. Okay, either... Either J and K were, were initially connected, in which case, if I go from here to here, then K has space for this new edge. So the number of edges does not increase for K. Uh, and then for otherwise, if I had a node K and they were connected through an element, okay, then... Um, we could we could have this all right so we have to we have to do some very careful counting here because these three nodes now are connected to k so k can see grow quite a bit k could have looked just like this and now k has its degree is increased in the quotient graph from 1 to 4 oh but the only way it can go from 1 to 4 is if Either um, this edge is accounted for because it was an original, this is now the element, it was in the original graph. Say it looked, I'm sorry, it went from two to four. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm changing my, my analogy in the, in the middle here. So either this edge was there in the beginning from K to J, node K to node J, in which case that's accounted for, or these nodes here are accounted for in the adjacency list of a now dead element. And if I can scavenge the, the, the memory space for this, every edge here will appear here and no more than that. In fact, this is a set union. LK is equal to the set union of all its elements. So if I use this notation to denote to denote node-to-node uh, -node connectivity, which I use the letter A because this reflects original entries in the A matrix. They get pruned as we go along, but it's, it starts out as the A matrix. I use L here because these re represent non-zero patterns of columns of L. And if you're next to a node, you can just you, you then need to take you know node K here. This is one of those E's here next to K. You take the set union. Well. The size of a set union, LK, the size of LK in terms of the, the, this, just the set union, which this I have to explicitly represent, this list. This is the element connectivity for node K. This, this is these four nodes here, one, these four edges. Okay. A, a set union, this is all a big set union. A set union is always less than or equal to the sum of the sizes of, of the sets taken into their, taken together, right? So the set union K, the result LK is, is less than or equal to the sum of the sizes of the sets that used to take part in it, okay? And then why this can be done in place is because all of these sets including this one, are no longer needed once LK is constructed because there's no element next to another element. If I left element E in here, I'd have an element next to an element, and I don't need that. 
So once the set union is constructed, all of the things used to construct the set element, or the set union, I'm sorry, once the set union is constructed, computed, all the things used to compute the set union can be discarded. And if they're discarded, then the algorithm works in place because the size of the data structure is just going down. The total number of edges in the graph, which started out to be all those edges plus all those edges, is now those edges. See, it's going down. So the whole graph then, this whole graph representation for the quotient graph, and this is one of the key advantages of the, qu of the quotient graph, is that the data structure is always shrinking. Now, the data structure is always shrinking, but any one, if you, if you lay out the memory, you realize that, well, to build the new element, I have to sort of reduce the size of other things and make this thing bigger. So there's some very dynamic operations that have to go on to, to, to make this work. It's not so simple as saying that every column just fits inside its box like you have in, in the sparse matrix computations you've seen so far. It's a little more difficult than that. So this code right here is much longer. It's seven pages in the book. Um, as opposed to two or three, as you've seen before for most codes. Uh, because this LK could be larger than whatever list we had for K to begin with. K could be, say, here adjacent to K and adjacent to E. and It could be of size 2 here. It could have been this. And now it's a size, what, 4. It went from 2 to 4. So the list of K did grow. If it's annihilated, because the list for the node k has two adjacencies, one node and one element. The node k has four adjacent to it. So the data structure for k will grow, but it will grow and the others will shrink. And all told, the total number of edges in the graph doesn't go up. But that makes for a rather dynamic data structure, because if k has to grow, you've got to, you've got to put that list somewhere. Where are you going to put it? You get the scavenge memory space used by the others to make it fit. So I'll explain how I do that. There's several ways around it, and I have one strategy. So we have the graph, we have the adjacency list, and this is A sub I is also going to be the adjacency of node I in the elimination graph, but in the quotient graph, it's only node to node connectivity. LJ I already explained. Script GK is the quotient graph as opposed to the elimination graph, and then EK is this clique uh, created when node k is eliminated. And this is the this is e for element. This is, I guess I'm using um, lowercase e, and here I used a calligraphic e. It's the, it's the new, new node name. So node k becomes not a node anymore. It becomes an element. Node k changes its name from node to element, and then elements get annihilated when they get adjacent to another element, like a black hole absorbing another black hole. So these are these dark circles here, then this is the quotient graph representation of this elimination graph. Elimination graph is simple. It's just the graph of the active submatrix. This is the quotient graph where what's happened here, this, when I annihilated node 2 here or here, these are equivalent representations of the same, no, they're different representations of the same underlying concept, uh, underlying connectivity. When 2 got annihilated, here we just eliminated and replace its neighbors with a clique, which adds this edge from 5 to 6. But over here in the quotient graph, we leave 2 in here as this ghost Cheshire cat, right, the element that says that this represents the fact that 5, 6, and 9 are all pairwise connected, in which case, this edge can actually be removed. So not only do I not add edges, like here, I actually remove edges from the graph. So this node stays there. And then now uh, node, node 3 got eliminated here, and there's no, this does not represent any node, um, sorry, element absorption, because so far there's no elements next to each other. But if 4 is annihilated next, which is natural here, I'm going through the numbers nodes 1 through n, in order, because otherwise, if you actually do the renumbering while you're looking at the graph, it gets very 
hard to follow. Okay, so there's actually no node renumbering in this picture. Even though that's the whole purpose <laughs> for what we're doing, it would make the graph, make the picture really hard to understand. So if, a, if we pick node four next, okay, then uh, node four then creates a clique, which is this, the set union of its original connectivity, seven and eight, plus the connectivity of element one, which is four and six, four itself, which is then ignored. There's no self edges. So four would say, hey, I'm a new clique connecting six, seven, and eight. Well, this node says that there's a clique between four and six. Well, first of all, four is gone. We don't need that. And four and six is a subset of four, six, seven, and eight. So I don't need this node anyway, this element, I'm sorry. So it, it would be absorbed completely. And then what else would happen is that this edge from seven to eight would be deleted as well because it's no longer needed. It's, it, it can be accounted for, if you will. This edge can go away because essentially it's accounted for in the fill-in from the annihilation of node four. See, when node four was picked, uh, where's seven and eight? When node four is picked, it caused, it will cause here, these two nodes to become non-zero. Well, they're already non-zero. Well, let's forget the fact that they were already they were already non-zero. Let's pretend they were zero from the beginning, and then represent the fact that these two are connected via fill-in, via the clique. So this edge can go away. It doesn't matter how it got there. It's, it can now be taken out. So that's the elimination graph, the quotient graph, and then the matrix itself. And they're all three related to each other. And so it's the quotient graph we're going to annihilate. Now, the difficulty now becomes how do you implement the heuristic? Okay, we, we've got the graph structure laid out. This is what's going to happen to the graph. Now the question is, what's the heuristic? The heuristic is take this graph and pick the node of least degree. Well, least degree in what? Not in the quotient graph. Because the this node 6 does not have degree 3. 1, 2, 3. It has three edges. But if I pick this node as a sixth node, really what I'm doing is I'm picking this node, which has four edges in the quotient graph. I mean, sorry, in the, in the elimination graph. So the degree I want to minimize is not the size of the data structure used to represent that node. Okay? It's this right here. This, this expression here. The degree of node k is how many nodes are you actually connected to via direct connections or via the cliques that you're a member of, the graduation parties you've attended, if you will, okay, the funerals. <laughs> okay, so you want to pick node k that minimizes a set union. Oh, my goodness. You've got to go recompute the set union all the time. Well, you don't have to recompute it all the time because when you touch this graph, when you grab a node here, you only have to recompute the degrees of nodes for here. If I pick node one first, all I have to do is recompute the nodes of four and six. The rest of the graph doesn't change, so the degrees don't change. So the, node re the degree recalculation only has to be done for the elements touched, I'm sorry, I used the wrong word, the nodes in the current element. So once node k is, ele sorry, once element k is formed here, we've got to go back and fix, recompute the degree of all these nodes i. So to recompute that, what would we have to do if we want the exact answer? We would have to go through and do this entire set union because the degree is equal to this. That's expensive. I have to go to every node who is my neighbor, an uh, in every node in element K, and every node there I have to do a set union of all the elements it's part of and its original connectivity. Plus, I also have to do all this data pruning of saying, here, for instance, remember, I, I deleted this edge. Camera over this side, please. 
I had to delete this edge here. Okay, I've got to, for node 4, I've got to recompute its degree, D4. I have to do some data pruning. I have to do some data addition because I added, in, in node 4, I added an edge to element 2, which now is newly created. So there's lots of work to be done for node 4, but the worst part of the work is to recompute this set union. That's expensive. And so I'll show you how we can simply avoid that recomputation, a recomputation almost completely. Uh, next class. I'm not going to pick a node of least degree, but I'm going to pick a node of, of least bound on the degree. And I'm going to have a cheap way to compute an approximate upper bound on the degree, and that's going to be the heuristic instead. So we'll stop here. See you on Friday. <laughs>